The first explosion unleashed a nightmare on the hundreds of unsuspecting bystanders watching the fire at the docks. The scene on that unseasonably cool April morning immediately transformed into a living horror. A shockwave tore through the city. Vibrantly colored smoke billowed into the air, obscuring the sunlit sky, and flaming wreckage rained down onto the onlookers. The Texas City disaster of 1947 remains etched into history as one of the most catastrophic industrial accidents ever to occur in the United States. April 16, 1947. The SS Grand Camp had been docked in Texas City for five days. Originally called the SS Benjamin R. Curtis, the Grand Camp was constructed in 1942 in Los Angeles, California, as a Liberty ship which served in the Pacific fleets during World War II. After the war, the vessel was sold to the French government, converted into a cargo ship, and renamed the SS Grand Camp. The ship had made several stops prior to its arrival, including a stop in Belgium where it picked up 16 cases of small arms ammunition prior to departing Europe to cross the Atlantic. While docked at the port, Texas City longshoremen loaded the Grand Camp with 2,300 tons of ammonium nitrate fertilizer that had been manufactured in War Department ordnance plants in Iowa and Nebraska and shipped via rail to the Texas City Terminal Railway Company. Ammonium nitrate is a chemical compound widely used as a fertilizer due to its high nitrogen content. It had become a common commodity in the post-World War II era, supporting the growing agricultural industry and serving various industrial applications. However, while beneficial for agricultural and industrial purposes, ammonium nitrate can also become highly explosive under certain conditions. In fact, during the war, it was used to make TNT, a volatile and energetic explosive. After the war, it was diluted to make fertilizer. At around 8 a.m. that morning, longshoremen discovered smoke in the cargo hold of the Grand Camp. They attempted to extinguish the flame with fire extinguishers and a gallon jug of water to no avail. After the brief attempt, the longshoremen were told to evacuate the cargo hold. The captain had the vessel's hatches sealed in an attempt to smother the fire. He ordered that no more water be used because he wanted to ensure the cargo wouldn't be destroyed. They filled the hold with steam in an attempt to put out the fire, again without success. Ammonium nitrate, being an oxidizing agent, was resistant to being extinguished by such means. By about 8.30, the pressure from the steam became so intense, the hatches blew off the cargo hold, releasing an enormous pillar of orangey-yellow smoke. As fire was an all-too-common occurrence at the docks, the brilliantly colored smoke attracted a crowd of spectators. At 9.12 a.m., just over an hour after the fire started, the ammonium nitrate detonated, and a catastrophic explosion tore through the ship. The blast produced an extraordinary shockwave that was felt in the state of Louisiana, 250 miles away, shattered windows in Houston, 40 miles to the north, and registered on a seismograph in Denver, Colorado, over 900 miles away. The ship's cargo, peanuts, cotton, tobacco, twine, and bunker oil, along with literal fireballs, hailed down onto a broad swath around Ground Zero. Molten fragments of the ship rocketed into the sky faster than the speed of sound. The 100-pound bags of undetonated ammonium nitrate were thrown half a mile into the air. The ship's 4,000-pound anchor was thrown more than a mile and a half from the site of the explosion. A barge called the Longhorn II, which had been anchored at the port, was launched out of the water, landing 100 feet onto the shore. Two nearby sightseeing planes were blown from the sky. The explosion produced a 15-foot tidal wave that slammed the shore, a wave about the size of what could be expected from a landfalling Category 5 hurricane. Surviving longshoreman Pete Sutterman subsequently remembered being tossed 30 feet. It was chaos. In just seconds, the Texas City dock was transformed. More than a thousand buildings in the vicinity were completely razed to the ground. 
Those that remained standing were unrecognizably damaged and left in dangerously unstable condition. This included the Monsanto plant, which was just 300 feet from the site of the explosion. Buildings that were not completely leveled had their roofs and doors blown off. Cars in the parking lot were tossed like playthings and utterly destroyed. Natty Morrow lived near the explosion and witnessed the smoke from her back porch. She later recalled the details of the explosion. Suddenly, a thundering boom sounded, and seconds later, the door ripped off its facing, skidded across the kitchen floor, and slammed down onto the table where I sat with the baby. The house toppled to one side and sat off its piers at a crazy angle. Broken glass filled the air, and we didn't know what was happening. The danger was far from over. There were two other vessels docked in the water nearby the Grand Camp, the SS High Flyer and the Wilson B. Keene, two C-2 cargo ships similar to the Grand Camp. The Grand Camp was engulfed in flames, and the flaming wreckage raining down around was igniting additional fires and setting off smaller explosions on shore. The Grand Camp was not the only concern. Buildings were ablaze, and the fire inched toward the other vessels in the water. In a tragic coincidence, telephone services were down nationwide due to a telephone strike by the National Federation of Telephone Workers protesting long hours and low pay by the telephone companies. For this reason, emergency response was delayed. However, when they learned of what took place, the phone operators sprung into action and returned to work to aid in the efforts. They summoned emergency responders from all around, including from the Texas National Guard, U.S. Army, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Reserves. Firefighters from cities in a radius of about 60 miles came in to assist, as did doctors, nurses, ambulance services, and more. Meanwhile, the force of the explosion had released the high flyer from its moorings, which caused it to collide with the Wilson B. Keene. The oil floating on top of the water was burning and spread toward the other ships. While the High Flyer didn't take much damage from the initial explosion, its hatches had been ripped off, and now the flaming oil offshore posed a significant threat. The High Flyer was loaded down with an additional thousand tons of ammonium nitrate. To make matters worse, it was also loaded with 2,000 tons of sulfur, which, when combined with ammonium nitrate, makes it far more volatile. The crew aboard the High Flyer desperately tried to raise the anchor, to no avail. After about an hour, the crew abandoned ship, no longer able to handle the smoke and potential for further disaster. Later that afternoon, however, two brave souls boarded the ship to search for injured crew members. It was at that time they reported that the ship's cargo was also on fire. They reported the fire to those ashore, but the issue was initially ignored. It wasn't until many hours later, at about 11 p.m., that the ship's anchor was cut and tugboats attempted to pull the ship away from the shore to mitigate further destruction. Attempts were futile. The ship would not budge. Personnel were forced to abandon the area in anticipation of another explosion. At 1.10 a.m. on April 17th, the ammonium nitrate aboard the High Flyer detonated. Mixed with the sulfur, the explosion was far more powerful than the first. The adjacent Wilson B. Keene was completely destroyed. Ben Kaplan of the KTHT News in Houston provided live coverage of the second explosion over the radio. Here comes another explosion. You have just heard it. The sky is like broad daylight. Fortunately, the area had been cleared before the second blast, thus limiting casualties. However, as expected, the damage was extensive. The pier was decimated. Nearby grain elevators were flattened. The intensity of the second blast was awe-inspiring. The SS High Flyer glowed brightly from the extreme heat. More inland fires were produced from the hail of flames that followed. One of the ship's propellers was launched over a mile inland, the very place which is now Memorial Park. In all, it's estimated that between five and six hundred people died in this awful disaster. All but two of those victims being from the first explosion. 
Victims included Chief of the Texas City Fire Department and an additional 27 firefighters. More than 5,000 people were injured. 1,784 individuals were admitted to 21 area hospitals. Estimated property damage was $100 million, over $1.3 billion in 2023. This damage included more than 500 homes being destroyed, leaving 2,000 people homeless, 1,100 automobiles, and 362 freight cars demolished. An additional $500 million, or $6.8 billion in 2023, in oil products were burned. It took more than a week to extinguish the flames. More than 200 firefighters came from as far as Los Angeles, California to aid in the disaster. To process the grim aftermath, rescuers searched for survivors and retrieved bodies for days after the event. The nearby high school gymnasium was converted into a makeshift morgue and an auto garage was used as an embalming room. 150 embalmers, including morticians and students, volunteered to assist. Dental students used dental records to identify as many bodies as they could. The relief efforts were huge. National fundraisers brought in much needed financial assistance and provided housing for the homeless. The response was so overwhelming, Texas City Mayor Curtis Trahan set up committees to handle the dispersal of funds. Much of the fundraising efforts can be directly attributed to Salvatore Sam Maceo, who was a well-known criminal who ran organized crime in Galveston, Texas during the so-called Galveston Open Era, which was marked by illegal gambling, prostitution, bootlegging, and racketeering. He managed to pull entertainers such as Frank Sinatra and Ann Sheridan into the fundraising efforts. The Texas City Relief Fund managed to pull in more than a million dollars, well over 13 million in 2023, and insurance claims paid out nearly 4 million. The exact cause of the fire on the SS Grand Camp remains unclear, with theories ranging from a discarded cigarette to a spontaneous combustion event due to the heat generated during the cargo loading process. In fact, Longshoremen noted that the bags of ammonium nitrate were warm to the touch when they were being loaded. A team of engineers, chemists, and transportation officials were appointed to investigate the disaster. The investigation found that there were no specific instructions for handling provided to the longshoremen who loaded the cargo, including no instructions not to smoke. According to the report, there was a general understanding among the longshoremen that no smoking on deck or in the holds was permitted, but was not respected. No smoking signs existed on the outside of the ship, but were only written in French. The attitude against rules for not smoking was known to be lax, and smoking was committed on the ship. It was also noted that almost no one handling the ammonium nitrate had any knowledge of safe handling practices. The final opinion of the investigation was that even if the fertilizer had been described as ammonium nitrate on all the shipping papers, the result would have been the same. However, it was noted that the fire could have been extinguished in the early stages if water had been applied by means of a fire hose. Hundreds of lawsuits were filed on behalf of the disaster victims, the most notable being the Dale Height case of 1950, which consolidated multiple lawsuits into one, filing jointly against the federal government. The Supreme Court, however, ultimately ruled in favor of the federal government. On April 19, 1947, a non-denominational memorial service was held for the victims at a local high school football stadium. More than 1,000 people attended the service. On May 30th, another memorial was held to honor the firefighters who lost their lives. And on June 22nd, the city hosted a funeral service for all the victims who could not be identified. This service was attended by over 5,000 people. The lives lost that day are honored in Memorial Park. It features SS Grand Camp's anchor, plaques naming those who lost their lives, and an Italian marble statue of an angel which reads, in memory of Texas City volunteer firemen. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this short documentary, please like the video and subscribe to my channel to help it grow.
Until next time.